Thank you. Members of the Board of Trustees, guests, faculty, friends, and the 2015 graduating class, thank you for inviting me today. Um, last week, when it was announced that I'd be speaking at the commencement, I saw a tweet from uh, at EFF Barbie. Um, she wrote, so, speaker at our commencement is some documentary dude named Marshall Curry, and not Stephen Curry, the MVP. <laughs> So I just want to say, EFF Barbie, if you're out there, I'm sorry, I'm just going to do the best I can up here. <laughs> um, I remember when, when I graduated from college, it, it, it doesn't feel that long ago. Um, the, the beard is premature graying. Um, I'd, I'd studied science and economics and history and, and was a, a, a major in comparative religion. And for four years, I sort of wrestled with all of, the, all of the big, hard questions and thought that college would, would give me some answers. But when I graduated, one of my friends, who was also a religion major, said to me, you know, I'm still confused, but just at a higher level. <laughs> um, and, and to be honest, this many years later, I, I'm still confused. I, I live in New York now, um, but for four years, when I was in fourth through seventh grade, I lived in Charlotte. And for some of that time, I actually lived on the edge of campus there, um, I used to wander around campus uh, making up stories in my head. I'd be a spy or a detective solving a mystery and all the students would be my suspects. Um, I bet you didn't know that you were being watched so closely by fourth graders, but, but you were. Um, I, I got a love of stories from my mom who graduated from Queens. She would tell us about when she was a student. Um, there was a curfew then. You had to be back in your dorm by midnight on the weekends. Uh, you couldn't wear pants in the front of campus. You had to wear a skirt or a dress. Pants were okay in the dorms, but, but, but not out in front. And you had to wear a hat to church, and church, of course, was mandatory. Um, but there was a little bit of mischief. Um, she grew up on a farm in South Carolina, and her siblings and their kids are all amazing storytellers. When I was growing up, we'd get together at the beach or at the farm and sit around a, a, a fire, and, and I'd get to hear all these great stories. And I remember thinking that, that they all had these amazing things that happened to them. And to some extent, that's true. But more, I began to realize, they just paid attention to the things that happened to them. They just noticed them. The rest of us have amazing things that happened to us, too, but, but we just sort of let them go by. I knew from the time I was pretty small that I, I wanted to be a storyteller. And I thought I might be a novelist or a journalist. But when I graduated from college, I began to discover documentaries, and I thought, that's what I really want to do. But I was nervous because I didn't know how to do it. It wasn't part of my world. My parents didn't make documentaries and none of their friends made documentaries. It, it sort of seemed like the kind of thing that, that other people got to do. So I did a number of other jobs. I, I lived in Mexico and taught English. I, uh, I taught government and politics to high schoolers in Washington, D.C. I worked at public radio for a little while and then I got a job working for a company that was doing touchscreen, computerized, interactive museum exhibits. And when the web took off, the company morphed into an internet design firm, and I got to oversee the design of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's first real website. And I really liked all of these jobs, but in the back of my mind, I just kept thinking about documentaries. When I turned 30, I, I started to feel like the door was closing on, my, on that dream, and, and I was, I was beginning to settle into an identity as an internet guy rather than a documentary guy. And I wasn't really satisfied with that. I didn't know whether I'd be any good at making documentaries or even whether I'd like it. I knew that lots of jobs and experiences seem very different from the outside than they actually are on the inside. But I really couldn't bear the idea of being on my deathbed when I was 90 and looking back on my life and thinking, it's too bad I never even tried. About the same time, I. I met a, a guy my age named Cory Booker. Uh, today he's one of the U.S. Senators from New Jersey, but at that point he was just an unknown city councilman uh, in Newark, and he was thinking about running for mayor. So I asked him if I could follow his campaign, and he said yes. So I took a leave of absence from the internet company where I was working, and I bought a camera, and I started shooting. It was a lot harder than I had imagined. I worked grueling hours and was usually there by myself, I was shooting and I was recording the sound and I had microphones and tapes and, 
and, and cables and uh, batteries spilling out of my pockets and I was carrying a clipboard with releases and driving the car and it was a little chaotic. And at one point it got scary. The, the incumbent mayor decided that he didn't want me to film and, uh, and started using his police to, to harass me. At one point they broke the microphone off my camera when I was trying to shoot. That night I'd come home and I'd look at the, f at the footage that I'd shot and I would just wince. Um, I was zooming in and out too much and I was overexposing some shots and underexposing other shots. But I try to watch it and figure out how to not make the same mistakes twice. And my shooting improved. I shot about 200 hours of footage and my first 50 are a lot worse than my last 50. When I was finished, I tried to raise money to hire an editor. Um, but every grant that I applied for, every broadcaster that I took it to rejected it. So I went back to the internet company and I did one more project to get my health insurance Cobra kind of recharged so I could leave again. And, uh, and then I bought a Macintosh and a copy of Final Cut Pro, the editing software. And I took a weekend class on how to do that. And then I sat in my apartment for a year and tried to figure out how to turn 200 hours of raw footage into something that felt like a movie. And it was hard and it was lonely and I was tortured by self-doubt. I would, I would run into my parents' friends and, and they would say, oh, what, what are you up to? And I'd say, oh, I'm working on this documentary about an election in Newark. And they'd say, oh, still? <laughs> and and uh, even, even my mom, who was incredibly supportive, you know, she would call sometimes and she would say, you know, Marshall, how you doing? And I'd say, fine. And she'd say, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> Which was brutal, of course, because I didn't know what I was doing, but I didn't want to have it said out loud. But I just decided I was going to finish no matter what. And I told myself that I wasn't going to second guess it. Once I finished, I would take a breath and I'd look around and just evaluate the experience, but, but not until I was done. So eventually I did finish, and I called it Street Fight. And to my surprise, it got into a few festivals, including one in, in Durham called Full Frame. And I remember sitting in the back of the room at the, at the premiere, the first time that I'd shown it to an audience. And I just sat in the back of the room and stared at the backs of people's heads and just said, please, please don't walk out. Just at least stay until the end of the film. And people didn't walk out. And a week later, it played at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York, where it won the Audience Award for the best film at the festival. And then it won another award, and then another one, and then it wound up on, on PBS and on the BBC and got nominated for an Emmy and an Academy Award, and it was incredible. Now, a quick note about the Oscars, which I'm sure is gonna come as a huge surprise to everybody here, but it turns out nobody really cares about documentary films. <laughs> you line up at the far end of the red carpet and there's like a thousand cameras, TV cameras, video cameras, photographers, and you would think that one of those people would wanna take your picture, <laughs> but no, they, they don't, not really. Um, it feels a little like when you're back in high school and, and George Clooney is the, is the quarterback and Brad Pitt is the cool kid in the rock band and you're like the science nerd. Um, but my wife and I had a great time at it. You know, we wandered around on the red carpet, we photobombed Leonardo DiCaprio and Julia Roberts and, and the whole experience was amazing and thrilling. And I tell that story because I think it's an example of following your dreams and pushing through hard times and discovering that sometimes there are doors that open when you didn't even know there were doors before. And I hope that all of you, as you start to think about how to spend your next few years, will keep that in mind. But here's the thing, is that that story is not the only story, and it's not even really the full story. I think life is a lot messier and it's more complex than one clean, inspirational story. There's another story that I don't tell quite as often, and that's the one about the year my brother and I tried to start an internet company together. We chased a dream, and it was a catastrophe. We lost all our money, we squandered a year of our lives, we both left feeling dispirited and totally humiliated. And the truth is that I've had a lot more dreams like that than ones that did work out. And I know it might seem a little unseemly to point this out at a commencement address, but not every dream comes true. Not everyone who practices hard gets to be a professional basketball player. So what do we do with that? Well, first we remind ourselves that while it's true that not everyone who, gets to, who practices hard gets to be a professional, 
It's also true that no one who sits on the sidelines gets to be a professional. And there's a saying in the startup world, fail fast, learn fast, and move on. And the startup failure with my brother had a silver lining. If our company had been a success, I probably never would have tried my hand at making documentary films. On the other hand, I'd be a billionaire right now sitting up here and <laughs> telling you about how I came this close to throwing away my life on documentary film. So I don't know, it's kind of confusing and, 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 and life is complex. But, you know, I, I don't think we should sugarcoat it. Failure feels terrible. And the more you care about something, and the more you invest in it, the more painful the failure is. And a big public failure, say, spending a year trying to get a startup going that never gets off the ground, that feels even worse. But the thing about failure is that it's all around us, but it's hard to see. Roaches are genetically engineered to skitter out of the spotlight and to get into shadows, and, and our failures do the same thing. They're embarrassing, and nobody really wants to talk about them. You look at Facebook and Twitter, and everyone's a success. They're all humble bragging about their accomplishments. They're having the times of their lives. They're posting these photos about their adorable, brilliant kids. And sometimes I feel like social media is just turning us all into politicians. We're all obsessed with putting out these scrubbed, positive images of ourselves and, and, and trying to improve our poll numbers. But no matter how cool or how beautiful or how successful the people around us seem, everyone fails sometimes. We fall short in academics, in our careers, in our relationships. We fail to follow through with our exercise goals. Everyone gets rejected. And the question is just what you do with it. One last story. When Street Fight, that first film came out, it was, when it was broadcast on television, I was very excited about the possibility of a New York Times review. This was before the Oscar stuff, but the festival reviews had all been really good. So I thought a good review in the New York Times would do a lot for the film and, and maybe help my career too. So on the morning of the broadcast, I got the paper and I excitedly flipped to the art section. And there was a big photo from the film and a headline. And then I felt like I'd just been punched in the stomach. It was the worst review I'd ever read. The writer was this freelance TV critic whose work I never saw in the paper again. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, but he was snarky and eye-rolling and dismissive of the film, and it was the New York Times. The most important periodical in the world had just decimated my little documentary. And I was crushed by what a review like that would do for the film. And I was mortified by what my friends and, and, and peers would think. And that afternoon, I was wandering around the city, New York, and, and, and I was by myself in just sort of this daze, and I got a call on my cell phone. I said, hello? And a voice said, is this Marshall Curry? I said, yes. And she said, well, this is Victoria Leacock, Ricky Leacock's daughter. Now, Ricky Leacock is one of the founding fathers of American documentary film. He was one of the first filmmakers to, to shoot films by just going into a situation and watching it like a fly on the wall. Before that, all documentaries had been interviews and, and they'd had voiceover. So this idea was just revolutionary. And the first films that he and his partners made, one of the first films was this film called Primary. that followed the, the 1960 nomination uh, between Hubert Humphrey and, and John F. Kennedy. And every film studi student studies this film. So I'd never met Ricky Leacock, but I'd been incredibly influenced by his work. I froze on the street, and his daughter said, my dad and I watched your film Street Fight, and we really loved it. And then we saw the review in The Times. And my dad just wanted to let you know that when Primary first came out, the Times trashed it too. And, and we wanted to invite you and your wife to dinner. So we went, and we had one of the most amazing evenings of my life. He was 85, but he was really sharp, and he was funny, and he was warm. And we stayed late just laughing and talking about the joys and frustrations of making documentary films and hearing stories about the old days and making plans about the future. And that's a story about how a public failure or a humiliation or rejection sometimes has a silver lining. I got a terrible review, but I got to meet, you know, got a friendship with one of my heroes. But it's also a story about Ricky Leacock's failure and humiliation and rejection and what he did with that. Fifty something years ago, when Primary was panned, he was devastated. This new kind of filmmaking that he'd invested everything into was being publicly flogged. 
But rather than shove that terrible feeling into the shadows or letting it make him hard and bitter, he let it soften him. And he let it make him a little more empathetic with others. And he used that rejection to remind himself that we're all frail and we're all delicate creatures. And decades later, he, he generously dragged that rejection out into the light and he used it to soothe a young first-time filmmaker who was reeling from his own rejection. For me, that was healing and it was empowering and it probably changed my life. So I'll leave you with just a few thoughts. Pay attention to the world around you. There are amazing stories everywhere. There's humor and drama and colorful characters if you just make the effort to notice. And be bold with your life and chase your dreams. And work hard. You can't control how smart you are or how talented you are or how lucky you are. The only thing you can really control is how hard you work. And if you fail, and you will fail, try to learn something quickly and get back up. And don't be afraid to share that failure with others sometimes. Try like Ricky Leacock did to, to let that failure make you a little gentler and a little more supportive of your fellow creatures who are also struggling and sometimes failing too as they chase their dreams. Thanks very much and congratulations on your graduation.